Hello learners and welcome to my session on organizing practical work. My name is Russell D'Souza and I come from Nirmala Institute of Education which is a college of teacher education in Goa. We will begin with looking at the structure of the session. So this session has two aspects. The first one is concept of practical work. The second one deals with the concept of classroom environment. And the third one is focusing on how to handle large classrooms. So this is the structure that we will be following all throughout the session. So when you look at practical work, what is practical work? So practical work basically would mean tasks in which students, they observe or they manipulate real objects or materials or they witness a demonstration that is conducted by a teacher. So, in practical work, the students learn by doing. Now, practical work can motivate a learner as it stimulates interest and enjoyment. I want you to look at this particular object which is given here. So, why is this source of electricity called a battery and not an electric cell? Because conventionally, we know what an electric cell is. It's a single unit. This is also a single unit. So why do we call it a battery and not an electric cell? Further, why is it called a 9 volt battery? So this means that a learner can be motivated to know why it is called a battery and not a cell. Practical work also encourages laboratory skills in students. It helps to enhance the acquisition of scientific knowledge because when you involve students in practical work, they learn to live the life of scientists, the rigor that scientists have, ex have experienced. So the whole le learning becomes experiential. Students gain insights into the scientific method and the scientific method is the method that science uses. So we are preparing students for the real world. It helps to develop scientific attitudes in students such as open-mindedness, objectivity, ability to question, ability to inquire, intellectual honesty and so on and so forth. So my dear students, practical work is a very important component of science teaching. So how can practical work be conducted? Is it only in class? Not at all. It can also be out of class. And when I say out of class, it can be anyway on the school campus or it could also be in the school laboratory. So gone are the days when we would say that practical work is to be done only in the school laboratory. The, 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 the whole concept is changing so very rapidly. And I have some examples for you for in-class practical work. And the examples are these. For example, determining the density of different objects in relation to water. Or the dispersion of light, reflection of light and refraction of light. The third example is identifying you know, a given set of lenses as concave lenses and convex lenses and concave mirrors and convex mirrors. Interaction with scientific methods and the list goes on. So you see, we can do all these things within our classrooms. So what can be done out of class then? Well, again, I have a categorization here. So what can be done on the school campus and what can be done in the school laboratory? So if I look at the school campus, have a visit outside the classroom and you will see a lot of things around you. And amongst the many things that you see, you will see plants. So let the children now learn about plants. So instead of telling them the different categories of plants, let them look around. Let them try and find characteristics and accordingly, we help them to put them into categories. 
So, the different categories that would naturally emerge are trees, shrubs, herbs, creepers, climbers, palms. Now, when this is also happening, there are exceptions that a child also encounters. For example, we commonly cite an example of a rose plant as a shrub. But then, on the other hand, you have the banana plant or the banana sucker, which is a herb, which means that the banana uh, plant or the banana sucker is taller than the shrub. So, these are all exceptions which a child now learns of. They can also learn about different types or different kinds of soil. So, you have the lateritic soil, you have the clay soil, you have the sandy soil and so on. So, different types of changes that are taking place around them. For example, physical changes, chemical changes, then how to use an extinguisher. And when I look at the school laboratory, you could have uh, activities like uh, what are the requirements for combustion to occur or what are different chemical changes that take place or testing for acidity or basicity of different edible food items or other safe materials. Now, learners, you have to be very careful and I make myself very clear that all this is not work in compartments. So, what is done in the classroom can also be done outside the classroom and what is done outside the classroom can also be done inside the classroom, but the extent differs. So, as a teacher, you have to systematically plan. So, how do we organize practical work in our classroom? The obvious answer to this is by managing the classroom environment. So, what does classroom environment mean or what does it include? Well, when we look at the classroom environment, it's a two-pronged process. There are two components to this. The very first one is the physical environment and the second one is the, the psychosocial environment. So, what do I mean by the physical environment? So, the physical environment of the classroom includes the different learning resources. So, which are the different learning resources? So, you may have books, you may have apparatus, you may, you may have certain, uh, certain uh, basic chemical substances that you require to conduct experiments. But be very careful when I say chemical substances, you will never have acids in the classroom or never bases in the classroom, all right? So, also a clean classroom with a lot of cross ventilation. You have a lot of adequate writing and working and sitting spaces, adequate storage space, availability of space in the classroom to organize furniture or sitting arrangements. Sometimes our classrooms are also so very overcrowded with furniture that it disturbs learning. And when I look at the psychosocial environment, it means the classroom climate or the classroom atmosphere. So, based on the interaction of key, of key players in the classroom, namely the students and teachers, a kind of social and psychological environment emerges. So, what sort of a climate does the classroom have? Is it the classroom in which students are encouraged to learn through trial and error? Are the contributions that are made by students appreciated and not their background? Do we discriminate students based on their background or do we look at the contribution that they make? My dear teachers, if you discriminate, you are killing a child. So let us not look at the background and other denominations, but we look at the contribution that the child makes and that is to be appreciated. What is the sort of communication that is going on between the students and the teacher, is it open, is it closed? Always keep it open, keep your channels open. What sort of communication is taking place between a student and a student? Is the interaction a sincere interaction? Are the students experiencing safety? They should at all times feel safe and secure. There should be no violence or no abuse. Then, how are difficulties or conflicts managed? Is there any, is there any system? to resolve conflict, how is it negotiated uh, and um, how do learners experience the culture of the classroom? Is it a positive culture? They have to 
follow certain boundaries and they work within boundaries and these are the elements of a positive work culture for students. So what do we do to keep learners engaged and learning? We organize the classroom. We keep only the furniture that is required. The second one is, depending on the type of practical work, organize the class. It would be better to design activities that contain both an in-class and an out-of-class element. So this would mean that working in small groups or small batches is facilitated. For example, we have an experiment on reflection of light or learning about mirrors and lenses which can be done conveniently out of class. Then depending on the type of practical work, a teacher may get students to sit on rugs or on small mats. Have a provision of several small chalkboards. If not, several slates can be utilized in the classroom so that students can write on the slates and probably lift the slate and show the teacher that this is what I have written or this is what I have drawn or this is what I have found out. We laugh you know, when we look at slates, but no, slates is a very good example uh, as an instructional tool in our classrooms. Cupboards, if unused, get them out of the classroom. Lay the furniture in such a way that it encourages maximum pupil participation. Move outside the classroom. If possible, you could even locate another room in the school. So this room can be used not only for science activities, but for other uh, activities like theater, yoga, and so on. Make use of the school corridors if there is sufficient access and space. Alternatively, use any space available on campus, including the school science laboratory. As an example, uh, I have a protocol and the procedure. So you are provided with two plastic uh, lids, colored yellow and red. You are also provided with four pieces of cellophane paper, namely red, green, yellow, and blue. So you see the lids down there. So make a prediction as to which color of cellophane paper, when wrapped over, say, the red plastic lid, would still make the plastic lid look red. So conduct the activity for the yellow lid as well. So what did you observe? Organize your findings in the given tabular format. Now explain your inference. So I'm making use of a predict, observe, explain strategy. And students do this activity and they organize their findings in the tabular format this way. So you have, uh, you have the yellow lid, you have the, uh, the red lid, and these are the different cellophane papers which are wrapped around the lids. And what do you observe here? You will see that the yellow lid appears yellow when it is wrapped in a yellow color cellophane paper. Similarly, with the red lid, it appears red when it is wrapped in a red colored cellophane paper and in no other colors. So this tells us that a yellow object appears yellow because it, it absorbs yellow and reflects all other colors. And similarly, a red object appears red because it absorbs red from the spectrum and it reflects the other colors. So this is an activity which can be done out of class conveniently by the teacher. So let the, see, let the children see the work that they are doing or they have done. Remember that we need to display the work that is done by students on tables or benches or on strings, wherever it is convenient for you. Children feel a sense of ownership when they see their work being mounted some way. They also learn to recognize the efforts and potential of, of their own fellow learners as well as their own efforts. So there is a feeling of togetherness that is developed. If more than one student works on a group activity. When we have large classrooms, we often look this way, we frown. And research says that when there are large classes, learners tend to get disengaged. This lowers class performance. Also, large classrooms means difficulty to employ effective classroom management tactics. And it also tells us that overcrowded classrooms makes it difficult for a teacher to compose learning groups. When I say compose, I mean create learning groups. Compose is a new term that is entering into the system of learning. So composing groups. So you have different groups that are composed based on abilities. And when I say abilities, I would always prefer a heterogeneous group. Heterogeneous grouping is the best. And also, you have cooperative learning groups that are created. 
So teachers find it very difficult when you have large classrooms. Now learners, when I say large classrooms, I mean the, the size of the classrooms in terms of number of students or learners and not the physical size of the classroom. Please note that. Do you want to look like this when you have large classrooms? Well, if you want to have a smiling face, then you probably need to do the following. So we have strategies to handle large classrooms. The first one is know your students by name, every single student and match names with faces. I know it is a very difficult, difficult task. It becomes difficult for me at times, but I try my level best to know their names and to match their faces. So call out to them by name. They feel happy. It makes them feel worthy and as individuals. Teacher knows my name and so I am happy about it. They will begin to participate as they know that they are being watched over by you. They conduct various science activities and they become all the more active. The sitting arrangement. Same, take some time out to relate names and faces. This could take you a few weeks. Break down clicks. To do this, change the places of students regularly. This would not only break down disturbance, but they will also learn to work and adjust with other learners. So there is social interaction, social learning that's taking place. At least once in 15 days, change the orientation of the furniture so that they feel excited seeing a different arrangement in the classroom. Let's look at discipline. Avoid harsh language. Avoid screaming at the students. Because when you scream, they have fun. So do not scream. Because the moment you start screaming, you have lost control. Do not threaten them with punishment. This is not discipline. Do not put fear in their minds. Do not instill fear. Do not use any form of corporal punishment at all at any given point of time. Not even a harsh word. Make use of positive reinforcement and if needed, negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. Please know this. I remember a couple of days ago in my class there was a child who was doing something. And I took the plan from her hand and I said, you will not get this back again. She was disturbed. I told her, hold on. At the end of the lecture, I will tell you what I'm going to do with your lesson plan. I handed the plan over to her and said, for my next lecture, you will take 10 minutes presentation time and you will talk about MOOCs. And in particular, you will talk about Swayam. So this was a negative reinforcer for her. It was not punishment at all. Talk achievement of fellow students in the class, that will fire motivation in the classroom. Observe the classroom learning behavior very carefully. Identify the learners who are struggling to cope with science activities. They may have faulty basic concepts and largely our students do have faulty basic concepts. It is very strange and surprising that a couple of days ago, I had a tough problem with a student who could not, who did not know what's the difference between an LED and a bulb. So these are basic concepts which students are expected to be knowing. Construct a teacher-made diagnostic test that will try and find out the specific difficulties that children encounter. Scaffold and offer support to help them come out of this difficulty. And you can also create peer learning groups so that these groups can, can coach the weaker learners. So in other words, we not only have teach, the teacher who is offering a support to the student or the students who need support, but also peers. So we have peer support also that comes into the system of learning. Plan your lesson and the activities meticulously. Every lesson that is planned must be interesting. It must be stimulating and rewarding for the learner. So in other words, active learning is the key. I just exposed you to a concept in which I had the yellow and the red colored lid. So extend this, try this out in your classrooms. 
the children will thank you forever for making learning so interesting, engaging and meaningful for them. Ensure that learning outcomes are clearly stated and the assessment is based on the learning outcomes. So there must be a match between the learning outcomes and the assessment. Use a variety of classroom strategies to teach science. You can make use of heurism, make use of discovery, make use of demonstrations, experimentation and the list is endless. Avoid the use of graphics in science teaching. Because when we make use of graphics, we are going into a world of abstractions. Pictures is the world of abstraction. Come down to the world of concrete experiences for the children. I do not discount the use of graphics, but use them judiciously. Only where they are needed to be used, use them. Otherwise, do not use graphics. I know uh, making use of graphics makes your work easier, but it makes life complex for a child. Your job is to make things easier. Go from simple to complex, from known to unknown, from concrete to abstract. Do not make abstraction the mantra of your classroom. Embed assignments that extend pupils' learning. Give challenging assignments to the learner. What could be the depth of the A horizon? We know that when you look at the soil profile, the A horizon can have different depths from something as tiny as a few centimeters to meters deep. Is water acidic or basic? They have to demonstrate and arrive at a conclusion whether it is acidic or basic in nature. All right. And after they are acquainted with mirrors, an assignment on vehicle blind spots can be given to them. So what we have done in this whole session is we have looked at the concept of practical work and how we can make practical work so very interesting and enriching for our learners. Remember, my dear teachers, that science is not teaching. Science is all about experiencing. Let them experience the world. Let them generate their ideas. You are a navigator, a facilitator. With this, I end my session. Thank you very much.